Okay, so before I begin, of course, I would like to thank the opportunity for being uh, presenting a little bit of what I have been doing. Thank you also for the financial support. I think that means a lot to me, especially because I'm just starting my research program. So that's actually my first animal project. So having your support uh, is really important uh, and encourages me to, um, to go for it. So thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, different from most of my colleagues, I don't have yet many data to share with you uh, at this point, but I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to explain why I'm doing this, uh, this research, why I thought that could be uh, important. So I'm going to spend a little, uh, some time talk about my research idea, the background of that, why uh, that can be important. And then I'll just mention a little bit of um, what we have been doing the field, uh, two uh, variables that we have that I'm going to bring today. Um, and then I'll take any questions uh, if you have. So since my master's program, I started working with stress mitigation uh, in cattle, but my goal when I think on stress is to increase efficiency in animals, you know, because you know stress can cause, um, it's costly to the animal, it's not free, right? So the NSAIN, which we use, it's called the NRC, uh, some time ago, I identified the major stressors in beef cattle, and uh, it it can be transportation, winning, commingling, right? But also uh, environmental stress is one of the major stressors cattle can face throughout their life. So this picture uh, I took during one of my PhD trials where I was uh, just evaluating the effects of shade on pasture, comparing cattle with and without access to shade, but was on a grazing system, cow, calf, and that, that picture you can see those heifers, they are squeezing here to try to enjoy the shade during the hottest uh, hours of the day. So when we talk about stress, I just want to kind of try to define it in a simple way. So stress can be any stimuli that can disrupt homeostasis or the normal equilibrium in the animal, right? And uh, in that scenario, uh, we can see there might be some signs of stress just by looking at to this picture because one of the indications of stress is behavioral modifications in the animals. So we can see reduction in dry matter intake. So animals in that case, they stop at grazing, right? They, they need to stay under the shade because it's very hot. So that is this behavioral modification. But also there is things that we cannot see during stress. So hormonal changes, we cannot see that, right? Uh, increasing cortisol concentrations or reductions in IGF-1 concentrations in cattle. Uh, systemic inflammation can also occur. Uh, tissue catabolism, changes in nutrient partitioning. Uh, in dairy cows, it's easier to see reductions in milk production, right? But in beef cattle, it's a little bit, uh, can be more trick to see sources of stress because we are not measuring growth all the time or weighing animals all the time. So we cannot see this window. Uh, of changes, but also we can see there is a there might be a reduction in reproductive performance on all animals. So in last case, when stress is really severe or when it's chronic, lasts for a long per period of time, we may see death, right, morbidity. But remember that before this to happen, lots of physiological modifications and behavioral modifications are happening uh, within the animals. So as, as some of you can know, uh, uh, might know, I did my PhD in Florida. So Florida has almost 1 million beef cows. It's a cow-calf state. That is a, uh, that is a lot of animals. Uh, it's really hot, right, uh, as, you, as you can know. And actually, the Sounder uh, United States has around 7 million animals. But that is really limited studies on the effects of heat stress in grazing systems, uh, especially in cow-calf operations. So there's a lot of research with feedlot cattle, uh, but those cows, they are in the pasture for years, they are there in our farms for years, but there is little attention to how they may respond to weather. So researchers uh, in Florida, uh, Dr. Mateuscu, she's a geneticist, and Dr. DiLorenzo, who was my PhD of, uh, advisor, they had this trial uh, funded by USDA where they were tracking, uh, they wanted to understand the relationship between thermotolerance and residual feed intake uh, in beef cattle. So I 
since I was there doing my PH trials, which was not this one, but then I got involved uh, uh, in this trial as well. So they, they, it was a long trial. Uh, this uh, project in particular, where they had collaborations with commercial farms. So they were uh, testing, um, they were collecting information related to thermal tolerance in beef, uh, in beef heifers. So uh, some traits, traits could be like cold score or some uh, stressors. And uh, maybe one of the most important they were measuring was body temperature of those animals uh, do, during summer. So animals were in pasture normally, and then they were collecting uh, temperature on those animals. So temperature is one of the first indicators of potential stress, right? Because if cattle cannot lose heat to the environment, it's going to build up. Uh, heat in the body, and that can be different from an individual to another. Here's just uh, how they use it to measure uh, vaginal temperature as a proxy of core body temperature. So just using blank cedars, no hormones, I butters on it, type it, insert it in heifers for a couple of days, then we could remove those I butters, read the data, gives really good data on how temperature of those animals varies within the day. So from that big pool of animals, they selected a few uh, animals. And here are uh, temperature uh, of the selected animals. So we had basically two groups, animals that had just uh, a 0 0.2 increase in body temperature throughout the day, while we had a group of animals that, were, uh, that had 1.2 uh, degrees Celsius increase in body temperature during summer. So we can see some animals were better uh, to control it, to control their uh, body temperature, while others not. So then we classify those animals as uh, TM thermotolerant and a non thermotolerant. And those animals from a commercial farm they went to the University of Florida, where we were measuring residual feed intake on those animals to see if they would be more uh, feed efficient or not. So these animals, they moved uh, to the farm and the this trial was funded by the Florida Cattle's Main Association. So it was really important because it was a trial in collaboration with producers, funded by producers. And uh, we ended up having this number of animals. We, when we run the statistics of the difference between temperature, so it was statistically significant. And then we did the RFI, we calculated RFI, we did the feed efficiency test, and the animals that were classified as thermal tolerance, they uh, ended up being more feed efficient as well. And uh, one important point in that trial is that those vaginal temperatures were collected during summer and the feed efficiency test was done ju just in the fall. So it was not during uh, this stress time. And that uh, they were, as they were uh, in the pens, uh, the fall was not that hot. There was even fans because it's Florida. They have fans, and uh, we can see that this um, had this thermal tolerance had even effect later on. So then, when I came to uh, U of A, I of course knew there was a lot of research on RFI here, right? Done in Alberta, done by uh, the university uh, AFC, and so on. And uh, they have been tested uh, since the 2000s, more than 12,000 uh, animals like cows, heifers, uh, feedlot cattle. But then there is no much information on the understanding of feed efficiency and environmental stress, right? So I thought I had all this background on uh, stress. Uh, I was involved in this thermal tolerance trial. And that when I came here in 2021, I remember it was a really hot summer, was dry, right? And at the same time, everybody was asking me how I would survive in winter because winters, <laughs> winters are really cold. So then, so then I thought about the cows because those cows, they are the same ones that are in the pasture during summer. They have to adapt to those uh, those summers, they are getting hotter for longer periods. And also they have to adapt for winter, which can be really cold. Uh, we are facing extremes, I, I think, in both sides, right? And that those cows, they are the ones that are every year in the pasture. So why not see if heifers with different uh, RFI would perform differently or would be more weather resilient uh, based on the conditions that are really particular 
was here uh, in Alberta. And that actually that has a um, uh, background support because one of the explanations for low residual feed intake animals are their, their uh, capability to thermoregulate their uh, body temperature. And also uh, is related with physical activity, which can be related to how much those animals can graze, how far they can go when it's really hot, right? And even some trials with piglets uh, that were uh, uh, selected for residual feed intake showed that uh, piglets, they can even uh, regulate their temperature during cold. So that is this relationship between thermotolerance and uh, feed efficiency. So there I found this trial uh, from University of Idaho that is not that uh, far from here. That is really interesting because it actually uh, was investigating the, uh, the effects of uh, whether or if animals that were more efficient or not, if they can be better adapted to rangelands. And that's interesting because those uh, pink dots here are the animals that are less efficient and the green dots are the animals that are more efficient. And the author said that animals that were less efficient, they were grazing uh, areas with lower elevation, which provided more shade compared to the animals that were more uh, efficient. So even though it may not translate into performance, so let's say, it, it can be beneficial in terms of grazing distribution, right? Nutrient cycling, how much these animals can explore other areas uh, and so on. So in this uh, same trial, they showed the time of grazing, the time those animals were spending grazing during different uh, temperatures. So the way we can look at that graph, here is um, daily activity. And then this green side is efficient cows. Uh, these red uh, uh, bars are related to inefficient cows. So here we have temperatures in August 9, which were good, was 23 Celsius. And then inefficient cows, they spend more time grazing during 23 uh, degrees Celsius compared to efficient cows. But then when it was August 21st, it was hotter, 30 degrees Celsius. Heifers, uh, cows that were uh, inefficient, they, uh, they spend less time grazing compared to animals that were more efficient. So authors uh, argue that those efficient cows, uh, sorry, the inefficient cows, they needed to compensate, increase grazing time on the days that were cooler uh, related to the efficient cows that could uh, graze, uh, maintain their normal grazing time throughout uh, the season, regardless if it was hotter or, or, or better the weather. So then again, uh, there is a lot of research focusing more on heat stress, uh, especially uh, in dairy uh, and some other species, but that is much less in, in cow-calf, right? Actually almost uh, really limited the research. And I was thinking that locations like here in Western Canada that we have um, harsh winters, more frequently hot summers, our animals, they are actually more prone to some degrees of environmental stress throughout the year, right? Because they have to face both situations. Uh, hot, um, hot and cold, and that can translate in impaired health or productivity or uh, reduced animal well-being, and that is really important because the predictions are that we're going to have more extremes uh, in the next years. And as we know, there is a lot of things uh, related to stress that we cannot see in the animals that might be happening, but we are not uh, watching to that. So then I wrote this uh, project where we uh, are going to be evaluating uh, and trying to understand the physiological and behavioral responses of uh, heifers that divert uh, in feed efficiency in natural conditions. So cattle is just grazing uh, pasture as they would do at a producer's farm. And then we're going to see if, uh, for example, heifers, more feed efficient heifers, if they would uh, trigger or no behavioral responses related to stress and see how it can impact the immunity and productivity. 
And uh, we hypothesized based on the background research that heifers, they are more feed efficient. They, uh, they can tolerate better uh, weather and uh, have improved performance compared to, to the inefficient animals. So what we have completed uh, at this point, we have done a feed efficiency test uh, at the University of Alberta. So uh, we tested 49 heifers. Uh, we came up with 20 trigger that would be less efficient, uh, sorry, more efficient, and the 21 that will be uh, less efficient uh, based on RFI. And then we would take those animals graze during summer and that we would track them during winter as well and see how they perform. So we have completed the summer portion uh, we have completed the summer portion uh, this past year. So we tracked uh, animal behavior, growth, and blood parameters, uh, but we are still in the lab analyzing the samples. Uh, and uh, that is a lot of data to process in terms of behavior and uh, internal temperature as well. So here's just uh, a, a timeline of the trial. So we did the feed efficiency test from April to June. Uh, last year, we came up uh, with the RFI classifications. Then those animals, they were all treated the same. Uh, there were no difference. They were not treated in different pastures. They were treated as a single group, since we, we know they, they are RFI. And then uh, we were uh, on day zero. Uh, in July, we placed pedometers to measure activity uh, and room embolosis to track uh, temperature. And every 14 days, we would be weighing and bleeding those animals to see their energy status, uh, hormone concentrations, uh, immunity, uh, and so on. So then uh, we started uh, this past January uh, to measure the same things that we measured during summer, but we are measuring in winter now. Uh, so we are measuring uh, a body weight, uh, blood activity, and the room and, and temperature as well. So here's just some data from the past summer uh, throughout the experimental period. So we have temperature in Celsius and uh, we have this um, blue uh, line is the average temperature throughout the uh, trial. Yellow are the maximum temperature. This dashed line is a threshold uh, based on THI, so THI is temperature humidity index. Actually, THI is more used for dairy cows, housed uh, dairy cows, but just for this presentation, I added as well THI so we can see more or less uh, where we are in terms of environmental conditions, but I'm in, uh, calculating cold and heat indexes, which I, I believe is more suitable for grazing cattle because it considers solar radiation. Cattle is exposed to solar radiation, right? Uh, wind speed can help during summer, but can be uh, detrimental during winter, right? So uh, I'll be calculating those. But uh, for today's, I, I brought just THI for us to have an idea how the weather looked like during the experiment. And uh, we can see there were some days uh, the THI was above the threshold of 72 until 79, more or less, which is a moderate. It can, can cause some uh, changes in, in cattle, and especially from the second uh, part of the trial. So I brought some uh, data in terms of animal performance, just uh, average daily gain and uh, weight during the summer season. So for RFI, uh, those are the averages uh, RFI from the two groups and they were statistically different. But for body weight, average daily gain uh, throughout the periods and also overall average daily gain did not change. Uh, and, and, and that's okay, right? So uh, it, it is a short period to see uh, differences in animal performance, but a data that I, uh, that we had some differences in terms of effects of day. There were no effects of interaction between RFI or uh, RFI and day, uh, or just the effect of RFI, but we had an effect of day. And actually it makes sense. So we did leptin, it was one of the variables we were doing. So leptin is a hormone that can regulate a feed intake 
during uh, feed intake in cattle in general, and it usually increases uh, during heat stress just to avoid animals to be eating and producing heat. You know, when animals eat, they produce heat. So, so then we could see that when THI, what THI is this, uh, this line here. So when THI was uh, a lower, uh, leptin concentrations were also lower. But then when THI increased, leptin concentrations uh, also increased in animals, regardless of R5. So that, uh, um, so that response happened. I also measure IGF-1. IGF-1 is a uh, anabolic hormone, really important for growth for cell differentiation, uh, reproduction. So usually greater concentrations of IGF-1 can reflect on, on better reproductive or growth rates. So as expected, based on leptin, uh, IGF-1 concentrations started to fall after those days that were hotter. So, um, so it co corrobor corroborates uh, with the leptin, uh, with the leptin data. So I still, we still have a lot of uh, analysis to do, but one of them are DIFA, BHPA, acute proteins to see if there is an uh, stress indicator uh, in cattle. We have temperature on animals, which are, we are measuring room embolysis temperature. And uh, with those room embolysis, we can see how much, how many times those animals they were consuming water because we can see the drop right in temperature. We cannot know how much. Uh, but we can know how many times this, we had this reduction in room temperature, so we can see uh, how many, uh, if, if a group was having more water or not, that's on one of the behavioral changes as well. We have behavior uh, data to be analyzed, like step, it's lane time, how much they were walking, uh, so we can know if there were reductions, uh, changes in behavior. So we are currently doing the winter measurements. So we are collecting uh, everything that we did for summer, we are doing again for the winter season. And uh, whenever I have the winter season, I'm gonna run both as probably as a factorial, having season and RFI to see if for example, one season is more significant than another on, on any more responses. And uh, so I think that will uh, be interesting to see. So I, I would like to thank, of course, my copies because of the support they, they gave me uh, since my beginning uh, here at the U of A, uh, Alberta Beef Producers uh, for the funding and uh, for trusting me uh, in such early stages of my career, my grad students for, for helping me to collect the data and uh, for all their dedication and also the Kinsale staff, because of course, without them, I wouldn't be able to collect anything. So thank you, and I'll be glad to take any questions um, if you have. And also, please, whoever is watching online, if he has any questions and wants to contact me uh, by mail or phone, uh, I'll be happy to, to talk to you. Questions? I don't have anything online at the moment, but it looks like Rod has one. Yeah, maybe I'll start. Hi, Rod. Uh, Carline here again. So what, um, what about hair coat? Uh, is that, was, did you measure that? Is there any difference between that on the animals? Uh, in the summer and then also in the winter, uh, or you're just assuming it's the same. Uh, so depth and thickness, I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. you know, because we often have said we want cattle with good hair in, in Alberta for the winter. And, and I don't know what good hair is, but other than the show ring. But. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that's a good, good question. So for that trial, we did not measure uh, cold score, but I'm, I'm, I want to see the data of this trial, but even before finishing, I'm having some ideas of, other possibilities, what else I can do. Uh, and uh, code score, I think it's really important because if animals do not lose uh, code score, they have greater chances to get heat stressed, right? Or if they don't build a good code score, they will be cold during winter. So that's a really important variable that I can add uh, in future trials. And building on that, I've got a question about coat color. Yeah. And if that was recorded, yeah, summer, summer in black, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's really important. And that was taking account in this trial. All of our heifers they are black, so we selected for black animals because black can absorb solar radiation, uh, and uh, those are the animals they are most prone to to heat stress. So all of them were black. 
So where all of those heifers derive from the same herd, like we can sell our yeah. herd. Yeah. Okay. They're all the result of the same selection of criteria. Yes. Okay. yes. Thanks, Glazy. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. I'm nervous to see the results. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not nervous for the work that you do, but it, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. You know, There's one I'm... more online. Sorry, Darren. Oh, you uh, bet. Building on the question regarding hair coats, will you be examining stress during the big temperature swings we get now during the winter, i.e. when it gets too warm? So thinking about sometimes, I don't know how many Chinooks you get at Kinsella, but I know <laughs> down south, you know, you can have a 30 degree swing in a couple of days. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. And uh, that's why I think doing wild animals are on pasture, you know, it's important compared to versus a chamber, for example, because we have those swings and the uh, physiology may take some days to, to animals to respond, right? So yeah, we are tracking uh, throughout two months, uh, uh, a little bit just for now. So we're going to be seeing those changes. This year has been, at least now, it's not that cold, but the next week it's going to be minus 30 in Kisela. So, yeah, we are able to track those changes. And uh, with uh, room and bolus, we are getting data every 10 minutes uh, all the time. So are you going to correlate this back to something genetic-based, or is it all going to be phenotypic? Well, I'm like at this stage, I would be doing phenotypic, but depending on what we find, uh, since we have uh, Grant, John, all of those mm -hmm. geneticists on the project, we can we can see like from how we can move forward, right? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you.